lined up tonight. It ain't just a trilobite, it's a trilobite. <laughs> and it's not just amazing corn, it's a corn maze. And this is a pretty cool story I got to hear two weeks ago. Uh, in case you're wondering, it's pronounced Lodi, although that's not always obvious. Is Lodi a biblical term? Is that a town know. in the Bible or something? Mm -hmm. um, so we have Brooke Norstead, who's from Alaska. Where were you born? Anchorage. Anchorage. Yep. And is that where you went to high school? Mm-hmm. And yeah. where'd you go for undergrad? I went to Gustavus Adolphus in St. Peter, Minnesota. Adolphus. That's that Catholic school. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Wrong <Sorry>. state. <laughs> we're coming up on October 31st, which is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther. And what college, what, what, what cathedral was it? Wittenberg? What's that? No, no, no. It's Wittenberg, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good Catholic boy. Okay. <laughs> and where'd you go for graduate school? I went here. All yeah. right. Yeah. And how long have you been here? I have been at the geology museums for 13 years, almost 14. Way to go. Yeah. How many days a week is the geology museum open? Six. 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 Yeah. Nine o'clock to one o'clock on Saturday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And as I like to point out, I don't know if Brooke does, but I like to point out the Geology Museum is actually older than the, than the university itself, which is pretty cool that it was stood up, established before the Constitution of the state got passed. <clears throat> so sometimes I think I'm old, but you guys are older than We're pretty old, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this story is pretty cool because it's got, not, it, it's a great Wisconsin idea story, but I don't know how they get their public relations machine ginned up. I'd like to stand close to it sometime. But they got coverage not only in the Smithsonian Magazine, but in Science Magazine. You don't do much better than that. So please join me in welcoming Brooke Norstead to Wednesday Night the Lab. All right, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and tell you about a big project that we've been working on at the Geology Museum. How many people have been to the Geology Museum before? I like it, I like it. If you haven't been there, we're on campus, we're a short walk from where you're sitting right now. Uh, we're in Weeks Hall, which is right on the corner of Charter and Dayton Streets. And we are open 44 hours a week, 8.30 to 4.30 on Monday through Friday, 9 to 1 on Saturdays. So you should come check us out. We have been around for a very long time. We're older than chocolate chip cookies. I like to tell kids that. Um, <laughs> and so um, the museum itself is, uh, is a science outreach facility on campus. And we have 50,000 people who come to visit us every year. About 12,000 of those are kids who come on guided group tours. So they get an hour long trip through the museum with uh, often it's an undergraduate or a graduate student who we've trained in to be a guide. And so we have a lot of energy and noise in the museum. But we also take the Wisconsin idea seriously. And there are lots of people for whom coming to Madison or coming on campus uh, is tricky. Parking, not great. Uh, you know, navigating this city can be tricky. And so I answer the phone for the museum, and so there's many of a time where I kind of talk somebody in. You know, they're like, I'm on Johnson Street, I'm passing a, and so, you know, it can be a confusing place to get to. And so we uh, like to think about ways that we can leave the four walls of the museum and go out into the community and reach people where they're at as well. And, um, when we think about the Wisconsin idea, this is a, a, a part of it. This is Charles Van Heis, who t he was the president of the UW, and uh, Bob LaFollette was the governor of the state. And together, these are like the co-conspirators, the people who kind of came up with the Wisconsin idea. Um, fun fact, Charles Van Heis was the first PhD awarded by UW-Madison, and it was in geology. So it all loops back around. Um, but this is my favorite part of the Wisconsin idea. 
I shall never be content until the beneficent influence of the university reaches every family of the state. Um, it's, you know, you commonly hear about the Wisconsin idea where, you know, it's the benefit of the UW reaches the borders of the straight state. And now that can be interpreted even more broadly, you know, lots of UW people go around the world. Um, but that can feel a, a little big. That's a big responsibility. And so I like breaking it down to a unit of a family. Families I can handle. They come in the doors all the time, and when we go out, that's who I talk to. I talk to people, and I talk to family units. And so I love thinking about this in the framework of helping the families of the state. And so in the history of the museum, uh, a person who I like to give a lot of credit to in this regard is um, a woman who was the curator of the museum between 1939 and 1943. And she took the reins um, and was a journalist by training. She was hired to be the curator of the museum, but she had this background in communication. And at that time, you know, when you think about science museums today, you think about people in those museums enjoying the exhibits, you know, maybe touching things or interacting, doing hands-on sort of things. But in the 40s, the 30s, that was not what museums were about. Museums were more of an academic place where researchers would go and look at specimens and they were much more um, uh, mature <laughs> than maybe what you would imagine a, a science museum is today. Um, Marvel, her name was Marvel Ings, great name. Um, she had a different idea about what a museum should be. She thought that people should come. People from the public should come into the museum and learn about these objects. She thought that the museum should go out into the community and, and take things with them, go teach kids about fossils and rocks. And since it was uh, during the war, she also really wanted people to understand how rocks and minerals, earth materials, contributed to the war effort, were part of um, the, the system that we were in. And so she, uh, she did those things. She would go up on State Street, and there would be storefronts, you know, the shops that are on, store, on State Street, and she would approach those owners, store owners, and say, could I put up an exhibit in your storefront? And so she would set up exhibits talking about the minerals that were being used in the war effort. Um, she would sponsor local competitions among elementary schools for kids to you know, write stories or create art objects about fossils. And then she would you know, award the winning classrooms a, a set of rocks or a set of fossils. Um, she also uh, had a story time. So she had a story time on Saturday mornings that would get 100 people in Science Hall listening to stories and she would write those stories and illustrate them. And so uh, she was a little controversial. Uh, I've seen headlines that say, men have misgivings about Miss Ings. <laughs> um, she was called a gir girl curator at the time. Um, but since she had a journalism background, she got a lot of press coverage too. We found a lot of clippings that include you know, anything from a short snippet about a story time, that I'll show you next to you know, uh, longer, longer form articles about um, the museum and her time there and kind of her philosophy about what museums are all about. And so I take a lot of inspiration from Marvel um, when I think about what museums can be. And that it's, you know, it's a very contemporary idea of what museums are, but I love how she pushed that boundary so early on. So here's one more little snippet about uh, her story times. And we have actually one of her books. She would take um, the little uh, golden guides that had like a golden spine, and she would type out a story and illustrate it. Um, and so we have one of those. Um, it's actually digitally available, too, with the UW archives. They scanned it, so you can look it up online. They're very charming. And so one thing that we do in the museum is we think about where are a lot of people and can we go there? And so where can we go and meet people who might not come to the museum? They might not choose uh, to go and visit a science museum on their spare time. 
maybe they think they're not interested in science or don't connect to it. So we think about where are there a lot of people, and then we try and get our foot in the door. So in the past, what we've done is we approached the Madison Mallards, and we said, can we have a night at the Madison Mallards? And so instead of, as people were coming through the gates, you know, you go and you get, like, swag from St. Mary's and the car dealership, and it was all scientists that you walked past. And we had tables set up where they got to learn about um, Earth's oldest rocks, Earth's oldest fossils. Um, here's one of our um, researchers in the department, the UW Geology uh, Department, John Valley. He studies Earth's oldest rocks. And so he was there. We had some very old rocks. We got to talk with people. And of course, you know, we're spending one to ten minutes talking to people based on their interest. And so this isn't, you know, we're not drilling down with people, but we're exposing a lot of people to what the UW does, real scientists, um, and a little bit of what their research is. We also, um, as part of this night, uh, we really kind of embedded ourselves in all parts of the ballpark. Um, there's, uh, you know, they have like in between innings, they'll have like little games out there. So we went out and chucked Frisbees into the audience that had facts on them. And we had a, um, this was sponsored by a, a NASA grant that I'm on. And um, we think about alien life and how it's microbial and, you know, what they're, you know, NASA's not looking for green-eyed, bug-eyed aliens, but they're looking for microbes. So we had a tug-of-war between kids and then people dressed up as aliens. Uh, shout out to George Rothdrake in the middle there. He was one of our aliens. <laughs> um, they graciously fell to the ground and were trounced by the kids. We also had um, our team of researchers who were on this grant. I had, um, you know, months, right when I kind of got the Mallards on board, uh, I asked our researchers, I said, would you like to go out and throw out the first pitch? And they were all, all five of them were like, oh yeah, that sounds great. And as we got closer and closer to the date of the actual game, they started dropping like flies. They were like, ah, I don't, mm. but one of our researchers, Eric Roden, he coaches his kids baseball team. And so he was like, I'm on board, I got it. So all, all of our researchers went out in the field. Eric threw one of the first pitches. So meant to be fun, meant to get our scientists out there interacting with people. Um, in August this year, we went to uh, Pope Farm Park out in Middleton, has sunflower days. They have nine acres of sunflowers that go into bloom at the same time. And uh, so there were a lot of people there. They have about 70,000 people who come through over the course of 10 days. <clears throat> but they also have a lot of sunflowers. And so when we were thinking about um, like with geologic time, it's hard even for a geologist to get their mind around deep time. And so we thought about sunflowers being a way that we could, could kind of get in the back door and get people thinking about deep time because there were a, a lot of sunflowers there. So what we did, we, we, we had sunflower seeds on our table. That's what this bucket is full of sunflowers, seeds. Um, so we started off by saying, okay, one sunflower seed equals one year. And then how many sunflower seeds are in this bucket? And kids love digging through that bucket. There's 20,000 sunflower seeds in that bucket. So if we could time travel back 20,000 years in this spot right there on this ridge at Pope Farm Park, we would be covered by ice. We were right at the ice margin during the last ice age. And then if we turn all the sunflowers that are in bloom behind you into seeds, you'd have about 500 million seeds. And that would take you back and in this very spot, 500 million years ago, we would be covered by an ocean. And so we used this kind of vast expanse of sunflowers to get at big numbers, big time. So that was in August. And um, last year we started thinking, okay, what was our next target? What's another place? A lot of people go. We like being outside. <laughs> we don't get to do field work so much. Our museum scientist does, but... Uh, the director and I don't very much, so we were like, oh, we want to be outside. What can we do? Where are a lot of people? Corn mazes. So we started thinking about going, approaching a, a farm that does a corn maze and seeing if they would partner up with us and do a trilobite corn maze. And I'll teach you about trilobites in a little bit here, but um, 
you know, agritourism is a big deal in our state. Um, there are corn mazes aplenty in Wisconsin. And so when we started thinking about it, we, um, we zeroed in pretty quickly on Trinan Farm Corn Maze and Pumpkin Patch. Um, it's run by uh, Alan and Angie Trinan. And both the director and I had been to this farm with our kids in the past. And, um, and we knew that they had some kind of science and math interests. So this is one that they did a few years ago. So it's the Vitruvian Man, uh, but also part cyborg. So you can see, got like a laser coming out of his arm and then circuit boards and gears. So looking through you know, the past mazes that they did, we were like, mm, we think that they might be interested in doing some science. So we just sent a cold email off to Angie and uh, introduced who we were, said, you know, this is what we're kind of thinking. Would you like to sit down and talk with us? And uh, she immediately fired back, uh, I used to bring my kids to you all the time. And so it was great that she knew who we were. She, I mean, not us personally, but she knew the museum. Um, she came and sat down with us, uh, and we chatted. So here are Alan and Angie. Um, so Alan, the, the farm that you know, is their farm. He's the third generation to grow up there. He's eight, the eighth of 10 children. And when I see the house that he grew up in with his, you know, all his siblings and his parents and his grandma, I'm just stunned. I have a small house with two kids and I'm just, that's too much. <laughs> so he, uh, he's the, the farmer side and she's the artist side. And she, you know, kind of runs all of the background, uh, work that has to be done in the hiring of all of the people that they hire for the fall and kind of getting everybody trained in. And um, She is a UW-Madison alum. She is a vet, a small animal vet on the side, and she got her degree here at Madison and is really a, a proud badger too. So she was very enthusiastic about talking with us and we pitched her this idea of a trilobite maze. And you might be wondering why a trilobite? <laughs> so, when we're thinking about how to teach people about fossils and rocks, um, we're often looking for kind of this sweet spot where we feel that there's a lot of potential to teach people. So with dinosaurs, um, it's frankly hard to teach somebody, especially a child, something new about T-Rex. There's a lot of competition out there. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of shows and programming and books. Um, and then there's lots of things that we could talk about that are, are um, difficult, they're kind of obscure, and so it's, um, it's hard to teach people about certain things because they don't have any scaffolding to hang that information on. Trilobites, we felt like, are in this sweet spot where people can look at them and even if they don't, can't say, oh, that's a trilobite, uh, they can recognize that as a fossil. It looks kind of like a bug interesting looking. There's a lot of different kinds of them. And so we zeroed in on trilobites because we thought that they were in that sweet spot of education. Plus, a particular type of trilobite is our state fossil. And uh, so we sat down with Angie. We pulled out a bunch of trilobites to talk to her about. Um, these are a few examples showing off the variety of trilobites that are out there. This one is on display in our museum. These are its eyes on the ends of stalks, so they would stay underneath the mud and have their eyes sticking out, potentially to like um, ambush. Some are very modest looking. Some have, you know, kind of wacky spines. Um, they can range in size. I'll tell you more about them, but the basic thing is that Angie bit. She was like, okay, let's do this. Um, that was back in February of this year, and uh, then we did a lot of percolating, a lot of back and forth emails, because she's like, what does a trilobite maze look like? You know, she's thinking about how people navigate a maze and what draws people to even come to the farm to do that maze in the first place. And um, she was like, yeah, people kind of know trilobites. You know, they recognize it as a bug, but um, you know, what's, what's this composition gonna look like? So we started making some sketches in the museum. 
And so this is just, this is literally an envelope that we are writing on. Uh, so one of the ideas we sent her was um, thinking about, you know, kind of in the theme of mazes and Crete, labyrinths, uh, minotaur versus trilobite. And then this was like a little rat card. Half man, half bull, all trilobite. Um, wields a double-headed axe, has a triple-lobed thorax. Um, she thought it was funny, but she was like, nah, that's not quite it. <laughs> and then we were like, okay, what about like a clash of the titans where you have you know, some fossils clashing up against some mythical monsters? And we would draw parallels between Medusa and the snakes on her head and uh, a, a coral's little, you know, what looked like tentacles. Uh, thought that was funny as well, but was like, no, nah, I'm not biting on that one either. And so she, uh, you know, she kept thinking about it and uh, was planning on going to, a, uh, to Paris with her son on a school trip and ended up breaking her ankle and couldn't go. And she was wistful about that and sad and was like thinking about Paris a lot and, um, and started seeing, you know, she was looking up pictures of Parisian architecture and then came across a lot of this Art Nouveau. Um, and that started kind of locking it in for her. She was like, ooh, I like these kind of tendrils. Um, I could see that being a component of the maze. And then, uh, if you've ever been to the museum, uh, one of the offices you can see into from the display area is the director's office. And um, it's just chock full of interesting things. Um, there's you know, barrister bookcases full of uh, fossils and rocks and interesting specimens that people have given us or we've collected. And so, inspired by that as well, she started thinking about cabinets of curiosity. So, uh, this is... Uh, uh, a drawing of a cabinet of curiosity. The, the idea behind these, these are kind of like the, the beginnings of museums. Uh, when people would travel or they would have agents who would travel on their behalf, those people would bring things back from the travels to kind of document where they had been and what they had seen. Um, and so here you can see kind of just a wild assortment of things uh, from you know big tortoise shells um, to there's like shells back here statues, armor. Um, this, is a, this is a cabinet of curiosity that is uh, at Grand Portage in Minnesota. Um, our director actually just incidentally ran across this uh, when he was on his vacation this fall. But here, this, so Grand Portage is a place where um, it's in between Lake Superior and then the waterways that would open up into the rest of um, North America. And so voyageurs would you know, gather in this place. Traders would come in. It was a, a place of commerce. And so there is this great hall there that was this meeting place where people would come. And so these are items that were collected there. And so you can see a narwhal tusk. There's a bighorn sheep. Uh, we've got, there's like an Eskimo mask. So these are all items that people have um, that voyagers collected on their travels, and uh, they even made it out to the West Coast before Lewis and Clark, about 12 years before Lewis and Clark, and that's documented by some of the things that they brought back. Um, so here's a cabinet of curiosity in Minnesota. This is even, this is Angie's bookshelf. And so here she's got things that they've collected on their family travels. You know, everybody's got these, you know, little souvenir piles in their houses. And then this, I swear, they bought at the Geology Museum <laughs> probably a decade ago. You know, these are, we, we sell these. Um, and so it was with this, this combination of Art Nouveau and uh, Cabinet of Curiosity that she came up with this design. So what you're looking at here is... Uh, the gridded out map of the maze, and Alan is holding this because they use that to actually cut the maze. Um, so they plant, when he plants the corn, they, he plants it in a grid. It's not just willy-nilly out in the field, it's in a grid, and then they place markers around the perimeter of this 15-acre field. And so when the corn is you know, six to 10 inches high, they hire a bunch of high school students to come out and help them 
and everybody gets their map. So this is Alan's map. And uh, they go out with a bunch of flags. You can see he's got his little quiver of flags here. And he'll tell one kid, OK, you go do this. Another kid, OK, you go work on this part of the bumblebee wing. And so by standing in the field, holding your map, being oriented, you can see where the markers are on the perimeter of the field, and then also within the field. And then they flag it. They flag the paths. And then Alan goes through on his tractor and cuts the corn. And then once they've got the entire maze, it takes them about two days to go through and cut the entire pattern, mark it and cut the whole pattern. Angie sends a drone up, takes a picture, and then they can look at the picture and look at the drawing and see if there's any mistakes. <laughs> and then they can you know, fix anything that needs to be fixed. And then at that point, when things are good, Aunt Alan will go through and actually plow the paths. So he actually digs up the corn so it won't grow anymore in the, where the paths are. And so um, you can see some of these spots, there are thicker lines. So this thick line is a 10-foot path. And most of the other spots where it's like kind of a normal weighted line, those are five-foot paths. So people kind of use that to help navigate when they're in the maze. Um, but once they get that all cut, they just let it grow. And right now, it's, it's like 12 feet high. And so when you're in it, you can't see out of it. You're using your map to navigate. And I'll show you a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. So here's some pictures of them actually uh, setting it up. So this is Brody. He's 14. Um, and he goes to high school with their younger son. And uh, so he was out there helping flag the, the spots. And so a lot of corn mazes, I've learned this since talking with Alan, a lot of corn mazes, people will hire a firm and they'll buy like the pattern and then there'll be a tractor that will come out um, that has a GPS set up on it. And so then the tractor will just do its business um, and cut the, the pattern. And so, Angie and Alan take pride that this is how they do it. They go out there and they lay it out by hand and they cut it with, you know, he's just driving around following those flags that everybody's been laying out. Um, and I think it gives it a much more organic feel to it and allows them to do kind of intricate things. And Alan, um, it was, we went out there the day they were cutting it. Um, so I'll go back a, a tick here. So, uh, Rich, the director, and I got to lay out, flag these three little lines here. Um, and so it's fun to hear them talk about, like, Angie puts in little details that Alan's like, oh, it's a real pain to cut that. Like, these little curly cues were kind of a pain this time because he has to, like, go in with the tractor and then back the tractor out. And so there's a lot of that kind of scroll work that this time he was kind of eye rolling. But it seems like every year there's one particular detail that you know, she knows it's going to bother him, but she's like, ah, it's part of the design. you got to do it. <laughs> uh, so he goes through, mows the paths, and then uh, this is a shot of the maze. And so it's this cabinet of curiosity. You can see the, the shelves. You know, here's our trilobite front and center. But what um, we ended up, once she settled on a cabinet of curiosity, I put together a Pinterest page with a whole bunch of ideas of things that could be in that cabinet of curiosity. And so um, uh, I'll walk you through the objects are in, that are in here and their significance to Wisconsin. Um, but first off, this trilobite. Now, this uh, just to give you a sense of scale, so this is a 15-acre field from the tip of its tail spines up to the top of its head. This is 480 feet. And so if we pull that trilobite out of the field and we put it down on Camp Randall, it covers up the entire field and a lot of the stadium. So this is a big trilobite. And Angie and Alan have been having fun uh, touting that they have unearthed the world's largest trilobite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so trilobites, let's talk a little bit more about them. They are related to bugs. They're in this family of arthropods. So they're related to uh, you know, spiders and crabs and um, uh, modern bugs that you would see today. They are, just like Tom alluded to, they're called trilobites because they have three parts. Um, and so some basic anatomy of these animals. 
They have this head shield called the cephalon. Um, and here, I'll show you later too, these are eyes. These are some of the first animals to evolve complex eyes. They have a thorax, so the main part of their body. And then this is one of my favorite geology words, pagidium. Uh, basically means trilobite butt. So they have <laughs> pagidium, thorax, and cephalon. But they're called trilobites because they have these three lobes running down the, their body. So they have this axial lobe in the middle and then the two pleural lobes on the sides. And so I went up and, uh, you know, when you go up to the farm, uh, you know, the people who greet you, the people who are helping give you maze maps, a lot of them are high school students from Lodi High. And uh, I went up there and trained those students because they were going to be doing a lot of this interacting uh, with the public. And so one of my main things, I was like, I don't want to have you say trilobite. No trilobites, they are trilobites. Um, and so by talking about this, that helps like cement that in their heads. Now, there's lots of varieties to them. Um, I talked about vision. Check out this guy's <laughs> eyes. So those are eyes. And you can see those little dots on there. Those are the lenses in their eyes. So when you think about uh, an insect and you think about compound eyes, uh, a common misconception is that when you, if you could look out through a trilobite's eyes or you know, a bumblebee's eyes, that you would see, like I would see 50 of you spread out. That's not how their eyes actually work. You want to think about each of their uh, lenses as being like a pixel. And so it's a, a unit of information that it's getting. So basically, instead of seeing you know, a, a multiple versions of, of you all, this field of vision would be reduced down to a certain number of pixels. Um, some trilobites would have, um, you know, on each eye, they would have you know, 20 lenses. Some had 15,000 lenses on each eye. And so with that, you can imagine a great variety of um, you know, resolution, basically, to how well or poorly they could see. And a lot of that is going to relate to you know, how much they need to see. And so some of these, like this little guy up here, that's a trilobite, that little black dot. Um, this one was entirely blind. You can see in a large version here. And so these lived in the deep ocean where they didn't need to see. And these ones, you can see this one with the, these tall eyes. This little lip at the top is interpreted as being like a little sunshade to help <laughs> block the sun. So living up higher where the, you know, there's light coming through the, the water, and it could actually have this shade that would help it see better. Um, and then, of course, there's this guy I pointed out before with the little eyes on the ends of its uh, <coughs> stalks. So a lot of variety. Um, in the fossil record, there are 17,000 species of trilobite known. And for context, uh, if you would take all the mammals and all the birds that we know of, that's 15,000. So there are a lot of trilobites out there. So basically any ecological niche you can think of in the oceans at that time, there was a trilobite living in it. Um, and they uh, were around on Earth for 270 million years. They, so they're really successful, prolific. They you know, were living in all of these different uh, ecological, ecological niches. Um, but they went extinct about 250 million years ago. So while they're not around anymore, we have you know, all the other arthropods that we get to. I just had a cockroach crawl up out of my sink yesterday. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of glad trilobites aren't around anymore. <laughs> Give me the heebie jibbies. What happened that killed them? Uh, well, you know, no single particular thing. So, all 17,000 of those species weren't around at that when they went extinct. You know, they had kind of different species had risen and fallen and gone extinct over time. Um, but largely environmental changes. Um, that was at the, uh, the transition into. Um, it's called the end Permian extinction. And so there's like large environmental changes happening at the time. But it's not a, necessarily a singular event. They were, you know, they basically hit their peak in the Ordovician about 450 million years ago, too. Um, if we make our way around the maze, 
Here in the bottom left, uh, this is galena. Galena is our state mineral. And I should point out, if we go back to the trilobite real quick, um, so when people talk about our state fossil, sometimes they'll say it's the trilobite. Uh, well, the former director of the museum, the geology museum, uh, he was around when that discussion was being held and when the legislature was being pushed to like name a, f a state fossil. And he said, we can't just have trilobites. There's 17,000 different kinds. Let's pick one. And so they picked a particular trilobite called Calemony Calebra, which is uh, a great one to choose for Wisconsin. It's very modest. No big spines, no flashy. It's like a Midwestern modest <laughs> trilobite. We can all be proud of. Um, but that one is not this one. This is Sororis, and Sororis is another trilobite that could be found in Wisconsin, but um, Angie chose it because it was a little more interesting. Uh, it has these spines, so these are not legs coming off the sides. The legs are on the underside of the, the animal. Uh, so the, it has these interesting spines, these spines coming down the side. These are called genal spines. It has these tail spines. So she wanted one that was a little bit more interesting than the Clemony. So we went with another Wisconsin trilobite. So uh, the state mineral, though, is Galena. And we wouldn't be called the Badger State if it was not for Galena. Uh, it's a, a lead sulfide. And it was mined heavily out of the southwestern part of the state. Um, it was a big source of lead. Um, they would melt it down. So if you've ever been to um, Tower Rock State Park, Tower Hill State Park, yeah, that's a spot where they would um, melt lead and then pour it down, and it would cool as it was, as it was falling through the air, and then it would be captured in a, a little puddle, basically, at the bottom, and it, they'd make lead shot. Uh, so miners would mine that lead out of the hills. So here's a photo of that dirty work. Um, and the miners uh, were given the nickname badgers because they uh, would sometimes not have houses. They would dig holes into the sides of the hills and live in there. And so it was meant to be a derogatory term that they were badgers. They had to live in the hills and they didn't have houses. Um, but of course, we've reappropriated that. You know, we're proud badgers now. But it's not because of the badgers that live in our state that were called that, but because of our mining history. So without that galena, we wouldn't be the badger state. Uh, here, another tip of the hat to a state symbol. This volcano, this is the kid's maze, actually. So it has a separate entrance off the side. Um, and it's snow fenced in, so your kids can't like make it into the big maze and get really lost. Um, I've tested it out on my own children, and they came out. <laughs> so this is a volcano, and uh, our state rock is red granite, which is a volcanic rock. It forms in the belly of a volcano. And so this tells us about a time when Wisconsin was actually, we had volcanoes here. And while we don't have the physical volcano anymore, we don't see those mountains, those have eroded away. We have the cooled magma chambers, and those are at the surface now. So you can imagine how much erosion has had to happen to be there. There's a town in Wisconsin called Red Granite, Wisconsin. And so this is a, a, you know, a, a statue that they have there. Um, and Red Granite is made of three different minerals um, that together, so granite in its own is kind of a, a garbage can term for a rock that contains three primary minerals. And so then there's a whole bunch of different kinds of granite based off of the proportions and what kinds, you know, the proportions of the minerals in there and some impurities that might change the color. But this red granite is very handsome because it has a lot of this feldspar that gives it that, that red look. Uh, down in the bottom right corner, what looks kind of like an empty ice cream cone is uh, a fossil of a nautiloid. These are animals that lived in Wisconsin when we were covered by a shallow sea. So about 450 million years ago, if we time tra travel back, you'd want to bring your snorkel and swimsuit because we were covered by a shallow sea. Wisconsin itself, North America, if you can imagine North America being tipped on its side and down by the equator. Wisconsin was actually south of the equator. And so we're like spring break paradise. If you have that in your mind, 
beautiful sandy beaches, lots of interesting creatures out in the ocean, um, and this is one of them. So here's this shell, and the shell, if you could peek on the inside of it, um, each of these lines that you see there correlates to like a, a wall on the inside of the shell. And then there was a tube that connected all of those chambers. So there are all these little rooms inside the shell. And one of my other favorite geology words is siphuncle. And that tube is called the siphuncle. And it would connect all those, ch those chambers, allowing that animal to move up or down in the water. These were the top predators in the ocean for a while. Um, and so effectively, I, I say, think of a squid stuffed into a long shell. Um, and that's what you're, you're looking at here. With our friends of the Geology Museum, our support organization, every summer we go out fossil collecting in a uh, quarry in Middleton. And so um, cephalopods, nautiloids are one of the main things that people find. They're a great find, too, because sometimes they can be quite large. So you can see here, you can see some of those lines. Um, a lot of kids, they just want to put on the goggles and get the hammer. It's a good excuse to break rocks. Uh, so moving forward in time a little bit, this empty bell jar signifies all of the vertebrate fossils that were found in Wisconsin from the age of the dinosaurs, which is zero. Yeah, we don't have that age rock in Wisconsin, and so we don't find that age of animals. Our museum scientists studies some of the earliest dinosaurs in North America, and he and his crew have to drive two days to get out to Wyoming to get to the right age rocks to find dinosaurs in them. So we thought this was our own little inside joke. So how many dinosaurs are there in Wisconsin? Nada. But interestingly enough, so we're specific in saying this is our vertebrate record because there are actually uh, four invertebrates that have been found from that time, the Mesozoic, when the age of dinosaurs. And so this bell jar indicates the invertebrate record. Now I said there were no rocks from that time period, so why do we have some fossils from the glaciers? So during the Ice Age, these you know, big masses of ice moved into our state and carried along with it a lot of stuff, lots of rocks. Down here in southern Wisconsin, people bring in stuff to the museum all the time where they're like, this is weird. I found it on my property. It doesn't look like the rocks around here. What's the deal? And we say, it came from Canada. You know, it came from the UP. <laughs> because those glaciers, they picked up a lot of rocks and fossils and moved them into places that they didn't belong. And they dropped them there when the ice melted. So there are actually a few ammonite fossils in, that have been found in Wisconsin, but they're in glacial debris. So it's kind of a trick question. So here's a, I like to talk, uh, show this slide because when people think about glaciers in Wisconsin, you know, you just think about Wisconsin having ice in it. But if you can zoom out and you can think about the ice, the, the sheet of ice that those little tongues of ice were coming off of into Wisconsin, you know, we, all of Canada is covered. You could climb onto that ice down here near Madison by Pope Farm Park, if you climbed up onto that ice sheet, you could walk to the North Pole without getting off. This is a giant mass of ice. Now at the top of the, oh, another, whoa, on the right hand side, yeah, there's this uh, spear point. This is a, a tip of the hat to um, an archeological survey that was done when they widened Highway 60, which is basically the Southern, right, basically if you hop, 20 feet this way, you're on Highway 60. When they widened that, they did an archeological survey and on the Trinan's property, they found some um, native artifacts. And so this is a, a, a nod to those. And this is, um, this is not a piece that was found on their property, but um, this is made out of something called the Hickston Silicified Sandstone. If you're ever driving up to Minneapolis, there's an exit for Hickston and there's a, a knob of rock there that is um, very special because it's made of this sandstone that's very um, tightly cemented. And uh, it was a prized uh, uh, material for native Wisconsinites to make 
arrowheads out of and spear points out of. So there's actually, there have been archeological surveys done there that have found lots of points and lots of work sites. And then um, this type of point has been found as far away as Kentucky. And so it, you know, it was a traded um, material as well. Uh, down at the bottom, this is a microscope. This is a field microscope and it's really cute. We have it in our collection. Um, it's this big. And so this was the field microscope of Charles Van Hees. And so or originator of the Wisconsin idea, first PhD of the UW in geology, and we have this cute little field microscope. So that's um, a little homage to, to Charles Van Hees. And so he was a structural geologist. He studied um, you know, kind of these major forces of how the earth works. And at that time, um, you know, was a real uh, forward thinker thinking about you know, plate tectonics basically before there was plate tectonics. Um, and so there's a rock up near uh, Devil's Lake that's called Van Heis Rock. Geologists make pilgrimages to this rock because this is a, a spot where Van Heis interpreted this particular outcrop. And um, his interpretation holds today, but it, it talks about basically you know, how did, you can tell that there's a lot of like uh, folding and tilting in these rocks, and so he interpreted the, the, the kind of story behind that particular outcrop. At the top, a butterfly and uh, a bumblebee, which are kind of classic cabinet of curiosity objects. Interestingly enough, the material that makes up a butterfly's wings uh, is the same material that makes up a trilobite's exoskeleton, chitin. So there's a connection there even. So what happens when you go to the maze, uh, they give you a sheet of paper that has one eighth of the maze on it. So originally when you walk in, they give you this much of the maze. And you see that little star there with a one? That's where you try to get to first. You enter the maze here and you try and figure out how to get there. And then once you get to the star, there's a mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get your ne next little scrap of map. Um, and so that's how they, they do this every year. And we were like, well, can we, can we teach people something at these mailboxes? So we made these signs with trilobite trivia. And so each mailbox has its own little factoid about trilobites. And then um, here's a picture of a family going through the maze last weekend. So functionally, you know, even when uh, people are, the maze is open like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, through the month, um, we are there on Saturdays and Sundays from noon to four, talking to people about trilobites. But even when we're not there, they're learning about trilobites. When somebody goes through the maze, they, um, they get also a sealed copy of the maze. So in case you get terribly lost, that's your fail safe. You can open that up and you can get the whole map. But um, if you make it through the maze without opening that, you get a piece of candy. <laughs> <laughs> so they collect those at the end. Um, but you get your map, you get the slip, you go through, you find the mailboxes, you, you make your way out. And um, this year, as part of the prize, when you make your way out as well, apart from the candy, um, you get your own temporary trilobite tattoo and uh, a map of the maze with a key on the back. So it teaches everybody who goes there, even if I'm not there to talk to them, they get to learn a little bit about the maze and the objects that are in the maze. When I was there last weekend, um, going through, you know, navigating, trying to find the mailboxes, I loved, they also put secret locations up that are not marked on the map that are a four by four post that have like a hole punch hanging off of it. And so if you go through and you just you know, wander every path, you'll find these secret locations. There's 10 of them. And so you punch your map and when you come out, you can brag about, I found eight of the secret locations. You get more candy if you find more. Um, but I loved being in the map and I would hear a family strategizing for how they were gonna find these and they'd be like, okay, you guys go look in the microscope. You guys, I want you guys to go over and look in the spear point. I just loved that people were navigating by the objects in the maze and then they were gonna come out and they were gonna get this and they'd learn a little bit about, oh, Charles Van Heys, oh. So it's, um, some of that education is embedded in the experience. Um, but then we're up there. So this is from last weekend. 
Um, we've got our crew with our trilobite t-shirts. And uh, we've set up a bunch of fun ways for people to learn about trilobites. And again, this isn't like deep dive learning about trilobites. This is just fun ways for people to get to interact with UW-Madison uh, students, staff, faculty, and learn a little bit about science in a fun way. So what do we have? We have a we have bago, uh, trilobite beanbag toss. So we've got three different targets that are three different Wisconsin trilobites. And uh, you know, we line people up, we have them chuck these bean bags, uh, we have specimens for them to look at of each of those types of trilobites, and we have more trilobite tattoos, so they can choose which trilobite they want. So we teach them a little bit here. Um, I love also that, um, so this, uh, Joel and Dylan, they are members of the Friends of the Geology Museum that we recruited to go up there and help us out. So it's not just our, our staff, but it's also our support organization who are up there helping us out a little bit. Um, here's Amanda, she's a student working with me, showing people specimens. Um, this was Saturday when it was not so bright and sunny. It was a little drizzly on Saturday. Um, but people get to hold real, real trilobites and ask us questions about it. We've got a spot where we teach people about trilobite egg, uh, legs and trilobite eyes. This is their prize station, so people go in here to get their piece of candy <laughs> and their <laughs> tattoos and their keys when they've made it through the, the maze. And then um, on display for the first time in the Midwest is uh, a replica of the world's largest trilobite, fossil trilobite. We're not competing with the world's, world's largest corn maze trilobite. Um, so the smallest trilobites were one and a half millimeters long. That's the size of a sesame seed, smaller than a ses sesame seed, like a flea. The biggest trilobites, um, there's been one of the biggest found. Um, its name is Isotelus rex, and it's 28 inches long. And so what you're looking at here, uh, so it's a partial uh, fossil, but here you can see this is part of its head. This is the thorax. Some of the pygidium is more of a mold than anything else. Um, there's a, this was found on the shores of Hudson Bay, and it was literally excavated at low tide. Like it was discovered, and then <laughs> they went out at low tide and dug it out of the ground as quickly as possible so it wouldn't be flooded. Um, and it lives, the, the original lives in the Manitoba Museum in Winnipeg. And we uh, called them up and we said, hey, we're going to be doing all this trilobite outreach. We want to talk to people about trilobites. We would love to have a copy of the world's largest trilobite. And uh, they said, that sounds really fun, but no deal. And then we called them back and we said, no, really, we'd really like to have a, a copy of it. So we had a, a number of conversations, and they ended up taking it off display, making us a copy. They hand paint the replicas. I mean, it's a really stunning uh, uh, replica, and shipped it to us, and we got it uh, a few weeks ago. So here we have a few. These are not the smallest trilobites, but we have some pretty small trilobites to compare to Isotelus rex. Um, <clears throat> and then we also recreated, uh, you can't see it super well, but um, so here's the Isotelus. And then over here, we got a, a cabinet, and we recreated the cabinet of curiosities in the maze. And so people can learn about um, trilobites in the middle. We have a sample of galena. We have an arrowhead. Uh, we have a nautiloid fossil. And so those are all things that people can learn about and interact with us about as well. Um, so again, we're going to be there Saturdays and Sundays this month, noon to four, so you can come up to the maze. I deputize you all to spread the word about uh, this project. But um, with that, I just want to thank the Trinans because they've been real gamers and a lot of fun to work with. Um, and it's really been fun to meet all the people we've been meeting every weekend at the farm. Um, one of my favorite quotes from this past weekend, the director was setting up, he's, uh, he's known for wearing flannels. And he was setting up and people were kind of, you know, it's, it's always when you're setting up that people kind of flock over to you. 
And so he's setting up, and people are asking him questions. And at the end, one guy says, boy, you sure know a lot about trilobites for a farmer. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 I'm not a farmer. But, um, but we've had a, it's been a, a lot of fun, and we're going to be there for the rest of the month. And then this, uh, this project is really made possible by a new endowment that the museum uh, has recently been gifted. It's the Sherry Lassar Fund for Geological Wonder, and that's really what we're all about. I mean, we choose trilobites because they're in this sweet spot, but really what we're about at the museum is getting people curious and lighting those uh, minds up, you know, getting people to think about the natural world and uh, really igniting <coughs> curiosity and wonder in them. So we're excited that this is kind of our, our inaugural project with that fund. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I brought along a lot of um, tattoos, so you don't even have to go through the corn maze. Um, and then I've got these keys as well, and then museum brochures and friends brochures too. So you're, uh, you're welcome to come up after questions and, and grab whatever you'd like. Oh, thank you. Any questions? Burning questions? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the 17,000 species of trial bikes. Yeah. Are, are new ones being found to add to that list? Yes. Yeah. Um, there are some places that are yielding new specimens. And then also, just our ways, and this applies for all of paleontology, our ways of looking at what has already been discovered have uh, improved so much too. And so there's discovery even to be made on specimens that have been found already. Um, there's a locality in New York that the trilobites are piratized. So the, the, the organic material has been replaced by pyrite, which is fool's gold. And um, they now, just in the last year, this was published that they think they found trilobite eggs for the first time, so they can look with high-powered microscopes, and they can actually find they find these little pyrite dots, basically in the, like by the cheek pouches of the trilobites. So, just our ways of of seeing have improved, which really impacts like you know dinosaur discoveries that you hear about now and um, and trilobites. So, yeah. How did they make a living? How did they make a living? Any way they could. There's so many kinds that they were predators, scavengers, filter feeders. Some of them are thought to be like uh, have symbiotic relationships with bacteria in their guts. Were there any academics? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they they did it all. Yeah. Can you describe just how to get to that? Yeah. So um, what I do, I, I take the pretty way, which is um, I go up. Highway 12, so you're heading north on Highway 12. And then I turn off on 19, Highway 19, and then catch Lodi Springfield Road, which weaves through. It's like a great biking route. Um, it's also my husband now, that was our first date, as he took me on Lodi Springfield on a bike ride. Um, but So that weaves through, and it pops you out on 60, you hang a left. I think you can also just take 12 up, and it intersects with 60. And then you just take 60 east. And there's big signs for it. Yeah. Lexi, yeah. Um, what's the name and scientific name of the smallest trilobite? Um, ooh, that is good. Um, <coughs> Plurella, Acantha Plurella? George, can you fact check me? I, I don't Acantha, know. I think it's called Acantha Plurella. I'll look that up and I'll email your mom about it though. <laughs> Shout out to Lexi for being our youngest audience participant tonight. She's like, gets to stay up late. She's a friend of the Geology Museum. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they would eat, they would burrow in the, the mud and eat worms. They would, um, sometimes you see predatory marks, like maybe they would munch on each other. Um, they would eat whatever, I mean, some of them were like, were symbiotic, so they would kind of get the materials that the bacteria would make in their own guts. Um, yeah, some were filter feeders and would just kind of like passively pull through material that's floating around in the water column. So kind of the whole, the whole enchilada. 
Yeah. So um, the last time one of these lived was how many thousands of years ago? Uh, 250 million years ago. Okay. Yeah. So how do you know stuff like that? About what they do? Aren't you getting, um, yeah. isn't a fossil just a piece of rock that's replaced everything that was there? It can totally or depend. It can actually be the trial of um, I don't know of them finding any, maybe some of the best preserved trilobites have some original material in them, but a lot of times with fossils there is replacement that's happened, so like the organic material has been replaced. Um, but it's by, so most trilobite fossils are the shed exoskeletons. They're molts, basically. You know, these are arthropods, and as they would grow, they would, you know, break open their exoskeleton and crawl out. Um, so a lot of what you find for fossils are those molted exoskeletons. Um, but in the best preserved fossils, they can, find, they can see the actual, some of the soft parts of these animals. They can see gills, like if you have the underbody, under part of it, and it's not just a molted specimen. Um, they can see gills, they can see all the legs, the whole abdomen. So they make a lot of one of the like guiding principles in geology uh, is that the present is the key to the past. And so there's a lot of like analogy that's being used. It's like, well, this is how these sorts of mouth parts work on modern arthropods. And so most likely these kind of trilobites were this, would eat this kind of thing. Um, there are some very, uh, it's very new, but there's, they can't tell what they would eat, but there are some new fossils out of China where they can actually see like the intestinal cavities and see like organic material in there. So a lot of it's interpretation. Do you know what those three chambers are for? You said they all have three chambers running the lake. The, the lobes. Yeah, what are those lobes for? Um, lungs no, so like all, all of their, so when we're looking at them, we're always looking at their backs. All the pictures I showed you were of their backs. So they're like, they would be kind of flat on the ground. Their eyes would be up. Um, and so all their little legs would be underneath. Um, and so it's by, it's by those kind of comparisons of looking at like, yeah, modern animals and, and these ancient ones that they can say, oh, these sorts of mouth parts and this arrangement of mouth parts implies that they would kind of break their food up before they would get it in their mouth. So they probably ate things that are bigger than their mouth. What are the things that are around at that time that are bigger than trilobite mouths? So a lot of interpretation, but based on reasoning. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. What's your next project going to be? Um, yeah. We, <laughs> I'm just hoping to live through October at this point. <laughs> yeah, just... Just last night we were talking, uh, we were at a, a board meeting for the Friends of the Geology Museum and um, you know, we, we're doing a lot of visioning right now because in the past we have been uh, poppers. You know, we have been incredibly frugal and so now with this uh, new endowment, it's really having, really having to reorganize how we view what we do in the museum and we've got these big projects but also just it's, it's changing the shape of, you know, what the landscape looks like in the museum. So a lot of it for the director and I now, it's not going to be quite so fun for the next year where we're doing more of like budgeting and <laughs> that sort of stuff. But we have, yeah, I have particular interests in um, working with homeless families and in prisons. So that's what I'm looking for, our connections into. So if any of you have connections into, like I've worked a little bit with Road Home, which does rehousing, like rapid rehousing of homeless families. Um, so like last Christmas, we went to their holiday party and cracked open geodes with kids. And so we were thinking it would be neat for them to have something to give away. And so we you know, went to their holiday party. And, um, but I'm also looking at getting into the prison system somehow and doing work in there. So those are like, that's the direction I want to head. Um, but I don't know specifically what it's going to look like yet. Yeah. Yeah. What's your, or do you have any association or cooperation with uh, Wisconsin Geological and Natural History? Yeah. Um, so we, uh, we sometimes collaborate on educational projects. Um, we've created a poster together that um, is like a simplified 
bedrock map of Wisconsin, because the ones that geologists look at are, you know, you show that to a kid and they're like, Ugh, you know. So we've, we've worked with them to create educational products um, in the past. And then, um, yeah, like Carol McCartney is their outreach uh, kind of point person. And so she and I talk every few months about stuff that we're working on and ask each other for help and whatnot. Do they ever find stuff that comes into your museum? Um, I think. We have gone out to their, like they have their own repository out in Mount Horeb. Um, and so they, um, we've, we've swapped some stuff in the past and there are things that are like that, so in our museum, we're in charge of the specimens the museum owns, but we also help with the faculty collection. And so we've helped, sometimes in the past, the faculty have you know, contributed things out to the geological surveys repository, and sometimes things have come to us. So um, there's definitely open lines of com communication there for you know, what, what we're working on and how we can help each other. Are you doing any uh, research in, in how how either science outreach is coming for uh, people to take a before and after survey of uh, what they think about uh, what you're doing and to see how strong your message is? Right. Um, we haven't embedded any, any evaluation into this, and that's my bad that I, um, I had intention to do that, but I haven't. I got swamped with other stuff. Part of this was we were going to create a trilobite costume. That was actually in the billing that... Um, Tom put out. So we have spent a lot of time creating a trilobite mascot costume, <laughs> but it turned out that we couldn't get it made in time, so we're going to unveil her at another time, but her name's going to be Marvel. <laughs> so, so maybe in the next couple weeks I can pull something together evaluation-wise, because I'm I'm really curious about, like, yeah, if how people are learning, if they're learning, you know, what this is, at, uh, what kind of impact it's having. Tom, yeah. Um, Two short questions. Could you tell us how you pitched the story and successfully got it into science and Smithsonian? Sure. And the second question is, who is Sherry? Sherry Lassar? Yeah. yeah. Um, so first question. Uh, yeah, so we got uh, covered in the online and print version of Science Magazine, which we're really excited about. Um, I'm mostly excited about it because Angie Trinan is a nerd, and she... Uh, loved getting interviewed by a science reporter. <laughs> and so I just like, I really pushed that because I wanted that for her. You know, there's no money transactions that's happening. Like, we didn't pay them to do this. They aren't giving us a cut of admission or anything. Like, there's no money being exchanged here. And um, just knowing her, I knew that that would like, she'd be really tickled. So that's, I pushed it because, so um, Dave Lovelace is our museum scientist and he was, um, uh, on the side, he was instrumental to planning the March for Science in Madison. Um, and as part of that, he met a, a local um, freelancer for science. Um, and so he connected me to her. I sent her an email outlining kind of the project. And she uh, uh, initially said no. She, uh, the story originally broke in July, like we posted a photo of it on our Facebook page, and so when she responded in um, early September, she was like, ah, it looks like it's already out there. Um, so, no thanks. And I emailed her back and I said, no really. <laughs> so you can see how pushy we are at the museum. <laughs> so, I emailed her back and I said, well, it, I mean, yeah, we put it on Facebook, but it hasn't, like, in any terms of news, it hasn't really broken, and, you know, we think this is innovative outreach and, you know, can we talk about it a little bit more? Can we talk on the phone? Can I you know, answer any questions that you have? And it was another email or two later that it became clear that she, she thought there was some kind of fi financial benefit to it. Like she thought we kind of bought our way in. Um, and once that became clear that like, no, this is, we just pitched this project and this is really just kind of mutual benefit to us, um, then it seemed to gain a little more traction with her. Um, so it took like, three or four emails back and forth. And how does Smithsonian pick it up? Uh, from science. I never talked to a Smithsonian reporter. And then uh, Lonely Planet, Atlas Obscura, um, we were just covering the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in the print version this morning. 
online yesterday. Um, UW Communications has covered it. There is some amazing drone footage. It's just fun. Like the UW Communications team went up there and sent up their drone. Um, so you can see kind of flyovers. It's got like very kind of majestic music in the background. Um, and then the Journal Sentinel also did some drone uh, work. And it's just really fun to get to see it from the air in this kind of dynamic way. Fly through drones through the corner. Yeah, I don't think they're that quite that skilled. Oh, <laughs> maybe. Sure. maybe. You should see the competitions, the drones. Yeah, I don't think the reporters are that skilled. Oh, <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. Maybe they'll do it at the end of the season. So what they do with the corn, actually, they, they harvest the corn. They mow it in mid-November and then... Um, collect the corn and use it as a harvest. So it, it gets used as feed corn. But they do choose a variety of corn that stays green longer and they plant later because they want it to be tall and still green for most of the corn maize season. Um, and then Sherry Lassar, uh, so the Lassar family, uh, uh, their daughter, Lisa, uh, went She's, a, she's one of us. She was an undergraduate here, um, and she gave tours in the museum. She's gone to the field with us. She um, uh, worked in our collections. Um, you know, she's one of, one of our kids, basically. And so she, um, her family is, are the donors who made that possible. And it was important to them. Sherry. Lisa's mom was an educator, and so it made sense that the fund would be named in her honor. So, yeah, we're really grateful to them. And they actually, uh, Dave Lassar is from Mount Horeb, and so they have come some. They have some local family, and you know, he remembers uh, going to Cave of the Mounds when he was a kid, and you know, so there's a lot of kind of geology connections there too. Other questions? All right. Come on down. Get your Charlie White tattoos. <laughs>